everyone. Welcome. We're going to be talking today about decontamination and sterilization of ophthalmic instruments. So I do like to start off with conflict of interest, although there are nothing in these slides that have any correlation, but I do consult in Mobius Therapeutics and I am on the board for the American Society of Ophthalmic Registered Nurses. So today we're going to talk about three critical steps. These are the most important steps. Actually, there are four. I added one extra one. These are our objectives today. So we're going to start off with cleaning and decontamination. We're going to go into sterilization. I'm going to discuss various methods of sterilization. We're going to go into quality control and how to test these sterilizers. And then we're going to talk about storage or return to the sterile field. So we're going to start off with a question from our first objective for decontamination. So the decontamination process should begin when? As soon as the instruments reach the decontamination area, at the end of the surgical procedure, as soon as possible after use, or when the surgery is, is near done? Let me know what you think. Very good. So it is as soon as possible after use. It starts right there at your back table, and we're going to go into that. All right, so first of all, why do we decontaminate these instruments? I hear this quite often. Ophthalmic instruments, they're not grossly contaminated. This isn't orthopedics. This isn't a GI case. Why can't we just take them out of the sterilizer, wash them on our back table, take them out of the operating room, wash them on our back table, and put them into the sterilizer? So first of all, cleaning and rinsing are the first and most important steps in decontamination. That does start right there at your table. But lens matter, viscoelastic agents, all these things can, per can permanently block lumens. They can get into those little cannulas, fecal hand pieces, saline salt crystals, blood, body fluids. This can all cause pitting and deterioration of your instruments, and it can be very difficult to remove. You've got organic material, you have soil, and all this type of debris can block the sterilizing agent from making complete contact with the instrument. So if you've got dry blood on those instruments, if you've got salt crystals, your sterilization agent, which can be stained, can't get to that instrument. So if you ever get an instrument back that has blood on it, I've heard it before, oh, well, it's gone through the sterilization process, it's okay, it's not okay. It actually blocked the sterling from getting to your instrument. Now when? Immediately. On your back table. Decontamination should begin immediately. Uh, during the surgical procedure to prevent that drying of blood, to prevent the soil and debris from sitting on the surface, flushing out your lumens right there on your back table. And then how do you do that? Instructions for you. So you're going to hear me say this over and over again throughout this talk. Follow the manufacturer's guidelines for instructions for use. We call them IFUs. And the manufacturers are telling you what you need to do to clean their instruments. These are instruments you purchase from them and they're going to tell you exactly what you need to do to clean them. And also, for its longevity, you spend a lot of money on these instruments. Uh, I know, it's, it's these instruments you want to last a long time. So you want to make sure that you're caring for them properly. And you want to follow the manufacturer's guidelines on how to do that. So, very common question these days. I think everybody's wondering, COVID-19, what are we doing in sterile processing during COVID-19? And I'm going to tell you, nothing different. Nothing different. Everything is pretty much stays the same, okay? PPE, personal protective equipment, universal precautions, everything that you're already doing is what you should be doing, including during these pandemic times of COVID-19. Utility gloves, liquid resistant gown, liquid resistant shoe covers, face mask, fluid resistant face mask, eye protection, you can be using goggles or even a face shield. These are all things that you're already doing. These are all things that's gonna keep you protected from COVID-19. Same thing with aerosols. You, some people ask with aerosols, you really shouldn't be having any aerosol spray in a decontamination room. Everything is typically done under the water line. So you should be washing your instruments. If you're washing them in a sonic machine, you should have the top on it. Or if you're washing it in a sink, you should be washing it under the, the water line. So you really shouldn't be getting any aerosol spray. Um, some people have asked about N95 masks. That's gonna be up to your facilities, policies, and procedures. There is nothing written stating that you have to use an N95 mask in sterile processing. What you're currently doing for personal protective equipment to protect your eyes, to protect your face, 
that should be fine. Um, but if your facility talks about N95 masks, that's up to your facility's guidelines, but otherwise it's not something that's recommended. So let's start off with manual cleaning. You have instrument wipes, so you can start off cleaning your instrument with a moistened sponge like an instrument wipe, soft toothbrush. I say soft because I know there's many out there with those hard bristles to really scrub instruments. You have these delicate ophthalmic instruments, so you, you want to use more a nice soft toothbrush. And instruments with lumens flushed with distilled water. You're going to hear me talk about critical water. Distilled water is critical water, treated water. Um, sterile water, that's all called critical water, okay, that's treated water. So you want to flush your lumens with distilled or treated water followed by compressed air, always followed by air. We're going to talk about mechanical cleaning. So you can have many different types of mechanical cleaning. You have ultrasounds, ultrasonic machines, you can see some here, larger ones, smaller ones, and then you've got the big large ones that look like dishwashers. Either way, you use a mechanical cleaning, you want to talk, think about the characteristics of a cleaning agent, okay? Whatever you're using for detergent, it should be low sudsing, low foaming. You don't want this bubbling up. Biodegradable, easily rinsed off, non-abrasive. It should be able to disperse organic soil and should be non-toxic. And you're gonna get this from the manufacturer's IFU instructions for use. When you're purchasing your cleaning agent, you wanna be looking for all of these characteristics from that detergent, from that manufacturer on the IFU. TAS, so I'm sure many of you know TAS, detergents and TAS, toxic anterior segment syndrome. This goes along with detergent. Okay, it is a acute, severe interocular inflammation of the anterior segment after interocular surgery. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's, it is not fun. It's not fun for a patient to have. It's not fun for us to see because we know that it can be tied back to many of these things, things that are happening in our operating room. Contaminated balanced salt solutions, irrigating solutions with abnormal pH. You've got your viscoelastic solutions, interocular medicines, um, intracamel antibiotics. The list goes down, but when you get to the end, you see inadequate sterilization of surgical instruments and tubing, inadequate flushing of instruments between cases, which can build up ophthalmic uh, um, viscoelastic solution. So you've got stuff inside those cannulas. Think about it. If you're not flushing them out, you're not cleaning them well enough. You're putting your instruments in a sonic machine with detergent. You're not rinsing. These things get left there and then they move on to the next patient. Okay, so this is how TAS starts. So the cleaning solution should be mixed with measured amounts of water. Okay, I've seen people use little medicine cups. Look at your IFUs, look at your instructions for use. You want to see what it's telling you that you need. How big is your sonic machine? How much water are you putting in there? And how much detergent do you need? You don't need any, you don't want to use any more than what you need. Don't guess. You want measured amounts. Rinse, rinse, rinse. I can't stress it more. Take the time you need to rinse. They must be thoroughly rinsed with copious amounts of water to be able to remove that detergent. I've asked people how much. Uh, I tell people, people ask me how much, and I typically try to tell them 120 cc's is average of what is recommended. Again, that's not really written anywhere. It just seems to be what everyone recommends when you ask them how much, how much, how much, about 120 cc. Rinse, rinse, rinse that you're getting through those cannulas. Tap water. All right, if you're using tap water, just make sure your tap water is compatible with the instructions for use for that detergent and for that equipment. So just make sure it says that you can use tap water. But either way, no matter what you're using, the final rinse should be distilled, sterile, or treated water, critical water, okay? So warm water, don't go more than 60 degrees Celsius, 140 Fahrenheit, that'll ruin your instruments, okay? You don't want hot, hot water. A lot of people want to use hot water, thinking that's what's going to clean it. You want warm water. Completely open and disassembled parts. So anything that you see that has jaws, um, scissors that you have to open up, you want to open those up when you clean and when you sterilize. The sterilant has to get in there. 
when you're sterilized. And now think about decontamination. Your, your detergent, your water, everything has to get in there to clean it. It can't get in there if it's completely closed, especially those jaws of that salt needle holder. All right, so when you're cleaning, completely open them up and you're gonna keep them open. Now, I say disassemble. If it wasn't manufactured that way, it doesn't get sterilized that way. Okay, so many people to save time leave certain instruments together and they don't take it apart. IA hand pieces, FACO needles, if they're not disposable and you can re-sterilize them. They keep them together. No, you can't, you can't do that. You have to take it apart, disassemble everything. If it didn't come that way in a box from the manufacturer, it doesn't get sterile that way. So make sure you're disassembling all of your instruments if it requires um, disassembly, if it comes in parts. No lumens and detergents. So this is, I stress this because of past. This is very important. Some people do do it and that's okay. That's, if that's their policy, um, then you have to really concentrate on flushing, flushing, flushing and rinsing, rinsing. But typically in ophthalmology, we try to stay away from that. We try to stay away from putting anything like cannulas, um, Simcoe's and sonic machines that have detergent in it because it can be very difficult to remove all that detergent. So you wanna make sure you're flushing it. You still wanna get it flushed out but not with detergent. Okay, lubricants. So you wanna use lubricants for hinge instruments only. Scissors, needle holders, some forceps. It prevents those joints from getting stiff and inhibits the development of corrosion. So lubricants wonderful. It's, it's a great thing to do for your instruments. It will um, keep its longevity. They get dipped one by one into the lubricant. They don't get soaked. So look at your IFUs, look at your manufacturer's recommendations. Typically with lubricants, they just get dipped and then they get they they dry. Right? But also make sure you do not put cannulas in lubricants. Okay, you don't want to you don't want to put anything um, like Simcoe's and any kind of cannulas and lubricants. All right, those are meant for scissors and needle holders and things like that. But it can definitely extend the length of your instruments and then dry. So instruments must be dried thoroughly before being stored, all right, or else they're gonna look like that. Um, if they get put away wet or damp, they're gonna rust out. So you have to take the time to make sure that they're dry. Now, one of the questions, actually quite a few questions that I received was about stains. And some of you were asking, you know, they're not quite sure what some of the stains that they see, what they are. So we're gonna talk about stains for a little bit. So, there's a difference between stains, rust, pitting. So stain is a discoloration of the instrument surface. Rust is a kind of a red or orange coloration on the surface of the instrument, and that's resulting from oxidization. And pitting, erosion, corrosion of an instrument's outer surface. It, it sort of can render it beyond repair. Um, these are tiny visible dots um, that we know they can lead to deep holes. But once you start with pitting, Typically, it's, it's beyond repair. You're gonna to have to buy a new instrument. So identifying them. So those brown orange stains, they can be rust. Um, when instruments lose their finish, like chrome or nickel, they become susceptible to rust. To rust. You've got phosphate residue. Um, that's usually from high alkaline detergent. So you want a detergent with a neutral pH, which should be around six to eight. Um, Again, IFU, look at your IFUs for your pH of detergent that you're using. Water quality, that last rinse should be with critical water, okay? Um, saline can also cause brown orange stains. You have those dark brown black stains that can be dried blood or it can be a high acidic detergent. Again, if you want to stick with something with a neutral pH. Blue gray, cold sterilization solution, something like glutaraldehyde, all right? So check your manufacturer's recommendations. You could be possibly exposing it to glutaraldehyde too long. And light and dark spots. So these can be water spots from inadequate drying, and that can lead to rust. So hopefully that cleared that up for you. Removing the stains, you can use a non-abrasive cleaner, you can use commercial stain removers. Honestly, you can use an eraser. Uh, many manufacturers' recommendations actually say that a simple pencil eraser can be sufficient to remove the stain. Okay. Now, if you've got more than five percent of the instruments, um, of your instruments that are stained, you need to do a good thorough investigation of what's going on. You can do a quality insurance study um, to determine the causing factor, what's causing all these stains, okay? You shouldn't really be having more than 5%. Sometimes, you know, you might 
be getting a new detergent, you might be noticing something, okay, you know, but um, just be sure if, you, if you're seeing it quite often that you really do a thorough investigation. Okay. All right, objective number two, we're gonna go into sterilization. So your next question, steam sterilization is best defined as forced ventilation of hot air, saturated steam under pressure, heated air, or combustion of organic substances. Let me know what you think. Awesome, very good. Saturated steam under pressure, that is your answer. So we're gonna go into that, so thank you. All right, so sterilization, chemical, liquid gas, we're talking glutaraldehyde or ethylene oxide or heating moist heat. These are the ones that I focused on because these are the ones that you see mostly in ophthalmology. Now, one of the questions that I get often is, which is better? Which one of these is the best way to sterilize the instrument? That's not the question. Actually, the question you should be asking is, which is more appropriate? All of these are great sterilizing agents, but what is more appropriate for you? What is more appropriate for your practice, for your center, and for what you're sterilizing? Okay. So let's start with chemical, um, liquid or gas. So heating provides the most reliable way to rid objects of, of transmittable agents, but it may not always be appropriate. Some of the questions I received was, how do you sterilize lenses? How do you sterilize certain tubing? So this is where different methods of sterilization comes in, because heating can cause damage to the heat sensitive materials, like fiber optics, electronics, certain plastics, ga uh, glass as well. So that's where you have to get into chemical sterilization. So something like glutaraldehyde. Right? It's an oxidizing agent. It works as a high level disinfectant agent and a sterilizing agent. It's used as a sterilizing agent by completely immersing the items into the solution for an extended period of time. Now, its advantages is you're using infrequent sterilization, it's inexpensive and it's very safe for lens instruments, all of your 20 diopter lenses. Disadvantages. So, it is a toxic chemical. The same properties that make glutaraldehyde a good sterilizing agent also makes it very harmful to the eye. It releases toxic fumes, especially when it gets heated. The fumes can have really pungent odor and can be very irritating. There's no reliable method of monitoring the sterilization process, and there's potential for contamination during rinsing and transferring, and it can be very toxic to the intraocular and extraocular tissue. Now, I have it in here because I do know many practices that do use it, and they use it on their lens instruments, on their 20 diopter lenses they use it in clinics. So it can be used, and as long as you follow your manufacturer's recommendations and you do things safely and correctly, yes, you can use glutaraldehyde. But you need to understand the IFUs. You need to understand the manufacturer's recommendations, and you also need to understand um, all of it, the risks that it carries. Okay? Now, ethylene oxide, this is gas sterilization. So EO is an, an organic chemical, it's a member of the ether group. So EO depends on four factors. Starts with gas concentration, temperature, humidity, and time. Okay, these are the four factors you have to have in order to run an EO process. So the process consists of a preconditioning phase, then it moves on to a sterilization run, it goes into a post-sterilization phase, and then it ends with aeration. Now, some of the new gas machines have aeration already in there. It's part of the process. Some of the older machines don't, and you have to remove the objects and keep them out some of them 24 hours to aerate in a specific area of your center. So it just depends on the machine or how you do aeration. So the advantages of gas compatible with packing material that can prolong storage life. It completely permeates porous materials and it's non corrosive. It, it doesn't damage items. And then we get into our disadvantages again. It can be very expensive. Cycles are expensive to run. Requires aeration, harmful to the operator, is carcinogenic, mutagenic, it's a long, slow, and complex process, and it's also extremely flammable. Now, I say this and I don't want to scare you and I don't want to push you away from gas sterilization, honestly. I've been using gas dilation for almost 20 years. And I think, I look back, probably the only time we've ever had an issue in 20 years that that warning light came on that there was a problem, the 
aeration ventilation tube that goes up out onto the roof. I think there was a, a, a bird's nest up there blocking it. And that's the only thing that I can even remember happening. If you do things correctly, again, follow manufacturer's instructions. It is a very safe and great means of sterilization, but it is expensive to run. Not necessarily the machine. The machine can be expensive, of course, to put in and maintain, but all of the items that you need to sterilize, you need the gas, ampules, you need a dosimeter, a humidifying chip, you have to do quality control with every load. So you, know, you just have to, to look at Look at the cost, look at the risk factors, and, and go from there. But it is a great way of sterilizing. All right, moist heat. This is one that we're all more familiar with. Saturated steam under pressure. So steam sterilization is the oldest, cheapest, and best understood method of sterilization. All right? Basically what it is, it's a pressure cooker. All right. Moist heat kills microorganisms by causing coagulation of proteins. The vibration of every molecule of that microorganism causes the splitting of the hydrogen bonds between the proteins. And then the death is caused by irreversible damage to all metabolic functions of the organism. It's a pressure cooker, all right? So let's think in the sense of food. Okay, moist heat versus dry heat. Steam coagulates a microorganism cell protein similar to how we poach an egg, all right? We're gonna start with an egg white. It coagulates when you poach in boiling water at 100 degrees Celsius. Frying an egg using dry heat requires at least 371 degrees Celsius and takes a lot longer. So the more moisture present, the more heat can be carried, making steam one of the most effective carriers of heat. So think about when you cook beef at home. When you're cooking beef at home, it becomes tough when it's roasted in a covered pan in the oven. Now you add a little bit of water to the bottom of the pan and the meat becomes tender. The temperature stayed the same and the time of roasting stayed the same, but the results were different. Now add pressure to that. By putting the same roast in a pressure cooker, you reduce the cooking time by three quarters and you still get a very tender product. So there's different methods of doing steam sterilization. One of them is gravity displacement. So it is the simplest steam sterilization cycle. Some of those tabletop sterilizers that you see, the smaller ones, those usually run by gravity displacement. And how gravity displacement works is steam is pumped into the chamber containing ambient air. Steam is less dense than air, so it rises to the top of the chamber and eventually displaces the air that's in the chamber. The steam fills the chamber, displaces the residual air, which is then forced out through a drain on the bottom of the sterilizer. And by pushing the air out, the steam is able to directly contact the load and start to sterilize. So basically, steam is pumped in, the steam rises, it displaces the air, and it contacts the load. A very simple process. Then we get into a vacuum cycle. This is called pre-vacuum pre cycle. This is actually a, a much more efficient form of sterilization. Um, it's, a, it's a much more preferred method for porous loads as well. How it works, it's equipped with a vacuum system. It starts with a series of alternating steam pressure injections and vacuum draws. These are pulses to dynamically remove the air from the chamber. And this allows the steam to be sucked into areas where it would otherwise have difficulty penetrating in the chamber. The absence of air within the chamber allows the steam to immediately penetrate the load, resulting in a more reliable, more efficient form of sterilization with shorter sterilization times. So you have the vacuum system, pulses that dynamically remove the air, and then the steam penetrates the load. So immediate use sterilization, this is IUSS, okay? This is a taboo word, I understand. Um, this used to be called flash sterilization. So it's used in critical situations which there is not sufficient time to process instruments through terminal sterilization, right? You can use IUSS, you can use immediate use sterilization. What the saying is you can't use it all the time for every load, for every patient. It can only be used if you drop an instrument. It is the only instrument you have in that facility. That surgeon is waiting for that instrument. Yes, you can use IUSS, but there are rules involved in that. It must be processed in the same manner and still must be cleaned and decontaminated. It still must be placed in a container intended for the cycle parameters to be used, and we'll go into that. It has to be used immediately. You can't use IUSS and store the instruments in a, in a package and store it for later use. You can't use it for a purpose of convenience. 
such as lack of adequate supply of instruments to meet surgical volumes. You can't use IOSS because you don't have enough instruments to meet the surgical volume. It must be compatible with the instrument's ISU, and it must be documented. Okay, the reason why you're using it. So if you were to use IOSS, that's okay, but document on your printout and your logbook why you used it. Okay, drop an instrument. You had to have that instrument. This is critical. Uh, I've seen you know reps come in late with an instrument that they want us to use. The surgeon wants to try it. It's the only one that we have. Came in late, the sur surgery's already started. We don't have that instrument in our hand. Okay, you're gonna use IOSS. It's critical, you have to have that instrument. But that's the only case of the day you're gonna use IOSS for that one instrument. And again, one or two instruments. We're not talking a huge load, neither. You can't do a whole load in IOSS, right? This is for one or two small instruments that you can put in the sterilizer for a for a very critical situation. All right, quality control. We're going to move on to that. Our next question: Chemical indicator strips are process challenge devices that will show color change indicating the items are sterile. The cycle length was sufficient. The cycle temperature was sufficient, or exposure to the sterilization parameters. Let me know you think. Okay, very good. Actually, it's exposure to sterilization parameters. They are not telling you that the items are sterile, not chemical indicator strips. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. So when we go into quality control, we're going to start with monitoring devices. Let me just check our time. Awesome, doing good in time. These are tools to validate the autoclave process. Okay, they're, they give you a real-time evaluation of the sterilization conditions resulting in a permanent record. These can be printouts, charts, gauges, digital displays, but no matter what it is, it should be telling you the time, the temperature, and the pressure. These three things you need to know. Accountability. At the end of every cycle, the operator should verify the correct parameters were met before the items are removed. Okay, you can, whatever your facility policy is for Accountability. Most facilities, what they'll do is the person taking it out, they'll initial the printout or the gauge or whatever you may have to show you the parameters, they're going to initial it. They're going to initial it. Okay. You could have a logbook with cycle information and the person who removed the items. You want to be able to track it. No matter what accountability you have, you need to be able to track those instruments. Should you get TAS, should you get end off the minus, you want to be able to go back and see match the sterilization cycle to what instruments went to that patient, okay? You wanna see who took them out, who initialed it, and this isn't to call somebody out, this is just for accountability, okay? This is just to know and understand who's taking responsibility for taking those instruments out, okay? So no matter how you do it, whether it's a blog book, whether you're initialing the printout, you need some sort of policy showing that you're tracking these instruments and you know who it is that's handling them. So chemical monitoring, these are your sterilization strips, okay, indicator strips. I think most of us have seen these. They react to change in the physical conditions in the sterilizer. So the one on the left you can see and the one on the right, they have not been one. These are, these are just right out of the box indicator strips, okay, but they will change color. Now the one on the right, is a class five or type five, and I'm gonna go into that, but you can see where it says dark bar must pass this point. It has to go all the way through past that point and to the accept range, okay? If it only starts a little bit and stops, it's not a good load. The one on the left, it changes color. That's a type one, okay? The treated paper changes color when exposed to certain sterilization parameters. Now there are six different types of chemical indicators. You wanna make sure you're using the right one. The classification structure is only used to denote the characteristics and intended use of each type of indicator. It doesn't mean one is better than the other. It's just to make sure you're using the correct indicator for the load that you're doing. All right, so type one was the one that you saw on the left. That's a process indicator, all right? That is not enough to indicate sterility all on its own. It only serves to differentiate process packs from unprocessed ones designed to react to just one critical process variable which is typically steam. You can take these, to my understanding, you can take these and put them over a pot, pot of boiling water on your stove and it will change color. All it means is that the, 
Sarah Eliza went through a process. That is it. So when that drawer opens, before you even look at the printout, to determine that it's gone through the correct time and the correct temperature, you can see that that type one indicator changed. So you know that it at least went through a process. The reason why we use this, it can happen. You've opened the door, or you've, let's say you've cleaned your instruments, you put the sterilizer, you put the instruments into the sterilizer, and then something happens and catches your attention, and you get called off. Somebody needs instruments. They come to the sterilizer and they see the door open, the instrument's sitting there, and they think it's clean, and they go to pull it out. They're not gonna pull it out if they see that that indicator strip has not changed yet. But if that indicator strip has changed, at least they know it's gone through a sterilization process. That's just step one. You have to verify a lot of other things, but at least you know it's gone through a process. Type two, that's a specific test indicator, and I'm gonna save that for last. Type three, single variable indicator reacts to only one critical parameter of sterilization cycle, it's usually used in um, gas plasma. Type four, multi-variable indicator, reacts to two or more critical variables. Then you have type five, and that was the other indicator on the right-hand side. This reacts to all critical process variables, time, temperature, and saturated steam. As does type six, and reacts to all critical process variables as well, this has a little bit of a, a tighter tolerance. Now that type two, to go back to that, that's a specific test indicator. That's what's called a Bowie Dick test, or sometimes we call them dark tests. It's a daily error removal, okay? It's named after its developers. The Bowie Dick test is a method to verify air removal from the autoclave chamber, right? It's only used in pre-vac sterilizers because of those pumps. We have to make sure that those pumps are working pro properly. It's run as the first cycle of the day. Any day you use that sterilizer, if you're using pre-vac, when it's the first cycle before any other instruments, sets, or devices are processed. Okay? Give you an indication of what it may look like. Um, it's like I said, it's used with sterilizers only with the pre vac cycle because of those pumps that they're using. It's tended to evaluate the sterilizer's performance. This is an above test, it's not a chemical indicator. All it's telling you is that those pumps are working properly. Pre vac sterilizers require a vacuum to be drawn in during the first and last phases of the cycle. So it's imperative to make sure that that's actually occurring. So you can see by the picture, you've got an unprocessed one right out of the box, and then you get to the middle, it's passed. All of those lines are uniform, they all look the same. The last one is a fail. Okay? Some of them is just a dot. Some of them you just see a one big dot, and all the dots have to match, like six or 12 of them. And if you see discoloration, some of the dots are really light, some of them are really dark, that's a, that's a fail. So here's our type five indicator, okay? And you can see on the left, that's right out of the box, and on the right is a pass. It has been accepted, okay? These have to be used in every container that you have, all right? Not just sitting on top of the instruments, not just sitting in the first container. If you've got a container for your FACO handpiece, it goes in the FACO handpiece. You have a container for your instrument, it goes in that one as well. You have a, a a container for your shop devices that goes in there as well. You want to make sure that that sterling is reaching inside all of these containers. Okay, it needs to verify the sterling has reached the content of the packages and the critical variables of the sterilization process has been met in every package. Okay, so either a class five or class six. All right, heat and steam. These are your these are your sterlings. Okay, column migrates along the path when exposed to all critical parameters, and then it stops at a safe or passing point, as you see on the right. And you get into your bug tests. Now these are biological monitoring, all right, biological indicators, BIs, and we just typically call them bug tests, okay? These are self-contained spores in a vial with sealed growth medium. Now they're exposed to, um, you're gonna expose it to a sterilization process, then you're gonna activate it, you basically, you, you crush it, allowing the growth medium to create a, a growth environment for the bug, and then you incubate it to allow the growth of the microorganism. The incubation period produces acid byproducts, and that causes the medium to change color. All right, so the spores that were exposed to the sterilization process are gonna get killed. So they're not gonna be able to produce acid, so there's gonna be no color change. You always wanna use a control whenever you're doing biological indicators, okay? The bug that was not sterilized, you activate it right out of its package, incubate it, and it will change color. All right, but you want to use the controls, you have something to compare it to. 
Now, indicated testing should be performed at least once per week. It really should be performed daily so you can track better, but minimum a weekly. And you want to do it during critical assessments as well. There's different types. Um, some of them are incubated for a 24-hour period. Some of them you can use what's called challenge packs, and they have a type 5 and a biological indicator together, and it goes into an incubator, and you have the results in, in 10, 15 minutes. Either way, minimum weekly. But not just that, you also want to do blood tests when you have sterilization installation, relocation, malfunction or failure, or after any major repairs. Right? You want to do three consecutive empty steam cycles and run with a biological and a chemical indicator anytime you're doing critical assessments. Okay? And then you do three consecutive empty cycles with a Bowie dick test as well. All right, each type of steam cycle used for sterilization, pre-vac and gravity can be done separately. So if the sterilization does both, then you want to do both tests. All right, the sterilizer should not be put back into use until all biological indicators are negative and chemical indicators show a correct endpoint response. Right. You can also do what's called outside of third-party testing. Reality is you have a logbook and you're writing in your logbook that you tested these sterilizers every day or you did biological testing once per week but really this is anyone can be writing in a logbook since it's been performed okay and that can be tested or that can be questioned so when you do third-party testing what you're doing is you're sending it out to a third party you're sending it out to an outside vendor and you have nothing to do with the results and that they're going to come back to you and tell you whether you passed or failed i have seen some facilities do this once a month i have seen some facilities do this one to twice a year. Depends on your facility's policy and procedure. You really should be doing it. So you have somebody else telling you that your sterilizer is working properly, not just you writing the log book. Okay? You have a spore strip and a control strip. You get exposed to the sterilization process. Cycle parameters are documented. Then you send it out to a third party for testing and the results are returned. You keep those results. You store them. All right? This gives you a results from an outside source. Okay. All right, so you have ultrasonic testing. Like everything else, your sterilizers, everything that you have, all of your equipment, how do you know that your ultrasonic is working properly, right? So ultrasonic cavitation testing. I mean, you really should be doing this on your ultrasonic machine. You're gonna make sure your ultrasonic machines are working properly to make sure that they're cleaning properly, right? It's done by cavitation. Cavitation, the rapid creation, destruction of vacuum bubbles or um, cavities inside the liquid. Those microscopic bubbles, when forced into contact with a solid surface, they collapse. And then the surrounding liquid fills the area the bubbles once occupied, creating an intense scrubbing motion. Okay? Um, as a cleaning solution rushes against that object being cleaned. This is how sonic machines work. How do you know it's doing that? How do you know it's doing that properly? So there's, there's different methods that you can use. Um, you can buy Sonochex. Um, this is something you buy from, from, you know, from the manufacturer. You can see those two little ampules. They go into the, into the sonic machine for a certain amount of time according to the manufacturer's instructions. And it comes back and whether it changed color or it didn't change color and tells you whether or not your sonic machine is working properly. You can also use frosted glass. Okay? This is another inexpensive way of doing it. Um, the frosted glass, you're going to see the particles. The frosted glass is going to show that the particles, that, that that scrubbing action worked by noticing on that frosted glass all these little particles, and you're going to be able to see right on that glass what changed. Then you've got your foil test. So you can see all these little holes in the foil. You can basically take tin foil, put it inside of your ultrasonic machine, and pull it out after a certain period of time, and you can see if it worked or not. Now, I can tell you that people have complained with the foil test that after you punch those, that, that ultrasonic, punch those holes into the foil, what happens to all those little pieces of foil? They can end up in your instruments. They can end up in your instrument tray or on your instruments. So I have noticed that people have been saying that that may not be the best way of doing it just because of that reason. But again, it's an inexpensive way of testing your ultrasound, but you should be testing it to make sure it's working properly. And our last objective, which is sterile storage, okay? So question for you, the shelf life of sterile packaged instruments is determined by the date, 
the integrity of the package, the size of the package, or by the facilities policies and procedures. All right, let me know, guys. Okay, so many of you did put the date. Actually, it is the integrity of the package. A okay, date is something that is included in there as well, but that's not what's going to tell you whether or not those, um, how long the shelf life is going to be. It's actually the integrity of the package, and we're going to go into that. So sterile storage, it can be wrapped packaged items like peel pouches, rigid containers, and wrappers. Okay, you have to make sure that the sterilizer and the instruments and the container must all be compatible. All right, you need to select packaging validated for the sterilization process and cycle parameters of your instruments, okay, IFUs. I'm gonna tell you a quick story. All right, this is a true story. Facility uses rigid containers for sterilization. They had an instrument at the floor and they needed that instrument, so they needed to do IUSS, quick sterilization there. So they cleaned it, washed it, did everything they were supposed to do, put it inside the rigid container. Now, because they were using immediate use sterilization, they had to use gravity displacement on the sterilizer, all right, to be able to do, um, instead of terminal sterilization, to be able to do IUSS. They put it in, they put in all their controls, their type fives, their type ones, everything done. The cycle parameters were complete, pulled it out, opened it up in the operating room, and none of the chemical indicators inside change. None of them changed. Done. Get rid of it. Oh, can't use it. It's not sterile. Why is that? How come nothing changed inside? We did everything right. Because that rigid container was not validated for gravity displacement. It's only validated for pre vac cycle. This is where your IFUs come into place. This is where everything has to be compatible. We put instruments inside of a rigid container and ran it under a gravity displacement cycle, and it's not validated for that. The steam didn't penetrate it. None of those indicators changed. We couldn't use those instruments. They weren't sterile. Gone. So that just gives you an idea of how important IFUs are. All right, peel packages. These are small, lightweight, you know, meant for small, lightweight instruments. I think most of us have seen these. Choose appropriate size to allow for circulation of steam. Don't put these big instruments in these little wrappers and it's just kind of snug in there. Right? You need to allow room for steam to penetrate. You want to use tip protectors, okay? Um, it can be used to prevent compromise in the package and all your shop instruments poking through. Um, these are steam permeable. They, excuse me, the tip protectors should be steam permeable. They should fit loosely. They have to have holes on them, all right? These are rigid containers. This, many facilities use these um, as a way of packing surgical instruments for future use or also just using throughout the day. But check your IFU for storage. Some of these um, rigid containers, once you sterilize something in them and it doesn't get open, it doesn't get compromised, they can stay sterile in there for, I know some of them have an IFU for you know, over 300 days. Um, it can be stored at as long as the container doesn't get compromised. Right? You need to confirm which sterilization process and cycle the rigid container is validated for, like we talked about, and match it up with the sterilization process and cycle permeate the instruments are validated for as well. And then you have wrappers, all right? You can um, use these to package, you know, instrument trays, um, double wrap to provide the best barrier. You want to keep it snug, but not too tight to, um, you know, you don't want it too tight to allow strike through and indicated tape to secure the packaging. Just keep in mind, m many indicated tapes are latex based. So your latex allergy patients, just keep in mind that a lot of those uh, tape that you use on these um, packaging can be uh, latex. Labeling. Packages should be labeled for accurate identification. Your packages should have the sterilizer number, if you're using more than one sterilizer, A, B, one, two, three, whatever you use, it should be on there for a sterilizer number. <clears throat> the cycle or load number, the date of the sterilization, the description of the contents of what's in there, and again, the assembler's identification of their initials, a tracking accountability. The what you're using needs to be, um, you need to put it on the package where it's visible, but it needs to be non-toxic ink. No chemical or toxic substances should be released during use. Immediately dry, waterproof, heat resistant, and acid resistant. Now, Sharpie does make an item 13601 black ink that actually meets all of these um, 
requirements. And I say that because I've been through so many um, accreditation and state surveys, and we've actually had surveys come in and ask what we're using to write on our packages. And they have recommended this particular Sharpie just because they know it meets all of these. Um, so this is what I'm typically used to using. Um, we have actually had people ask us what we're using. Are you using just regular pen? What, what kind of marker are you using? All right. So I just mentioned that to you because um, that is a, a safe marker to use. Storage. The shelf life of package items is event related integrity of the package. All right. Shelf life depends on the quality and integrity of the package, storing conditions, and amount of handling. Yes, you're putting a date on it. Yes, you want to know what the date is, okay? And your facilities policies and procedures can say, these are no longer sterile after six months. You need to redo them all. But there really isn't anything to back that up, okay? There's nothing saying that those instruments in there are not sterile after six months. It may be your facilities policies and procedures to re-sterilize everything after six months, but don't go just by that. You want to go by the integrity of that package. If after three months, you notice that that package has been crumpled up, something went on top of it, okay? Um, it's yellow. It's been sitting somewhere where this wasn't good circulation, the storage room you know, didn't have the best quality air, um, it's squeezed in a bunch of things and it turned yellow. Yeah, no, you don't wanna use that package. You wanna look at your package and look at its integrity. Make sure there's nothing that strikes through it. Make sure it's not discolored, right? This is what you should be looking at for your shelf life, okay? And so yes, you can make a policy and procedures according to date, but you shouldn't just be relying on just the date. It should be the integrity of the package that tells you how long something can stay on the shelf, okay? Prior to using a wrapped item, um, you wanna visually look at it, okay? Look at its integrity. You wanna be looking at its, um, Indicator strips and size as well, right? Before you open that up, you want to make sure you're looking at everything. Do not use elastic bands to secure packages together. Do not crunch, bend, puncture, compress the package. Don't stack them. These are your heavy ones, like the wrappers. You know, when you've got big instruments and wrappers, you're stacking one after another. I understand storage space is limited. Oh, believe me, I've seen every closet, every square inch of a facility used for every reason. Okay, so I understand that, you know, sometimes you need to, to think outside the box when it comes to storage, but you really can't pile up, you know, instrument wrappers and these big instruments on top of each other. You're going you're gonna to cause a problem as far as the integrity goes, okay? Undue pressure from weight. Don't store them on the floor or window sills or any other area other than designated shelves or counter, all right? Zip covers, like I said, they must contain holes. Um, I have seen people use all kinds of things for tip covers. And yes, there are many different plastics that you can put in a, in a heat sensitive, um, in a heat sterilizer that you know, is not necessarily as heat sensitive as others. They're a good plastic. And I've, I've seen people cut tubing, you name it. I've seen it for tip covers. Not to say they can't be used. They're really not validated for that. But regardless, just make sure that you can get steam through it. It has holes in it. You can't have the top completely covered. Okay, so that's why I recommend these tip covers. And on the bottom, you can also see these are relatively new. Um, they have indicators on them. So you can see like the orange and the blue will change color and steam or gas. And it's a nice way of putting your instruments safely on something so they're not you know, roaming around inside of that package and possibly getting damaged. Okay, so these are nice as well. Loading in an instrument tray must leave room for steam penetration. This picture really it gives me hives. It really does. People tend to just, they don't want to have to run multiple loads. They want to put as much as they possibly can in that load. And think about it. Your sterilant is steam. Steam needs to, or gas, or your sterilant needs to penetrate through these packages. They can't do that if they're stuck up against each other, okay? So don't, don't um, load these, start with these instrument trays one on top of another on top of another. You want to leave a little bit of room, okay? Transportation to the sterile field should be transported using adequate protection in a way to prevent contamination like a covered container, like those rigid containers, all right? 
So the top ones, yep, these are instrument trays. The one on the left, we all have seen these, and you can see this holes in. The holes are there for a reason to allow steam penetration. But when you're transporting instruments in these, you have holes in them, right? That, that's a chance for contamination. Same thing with the one on the right, right? You're putting your instruments inside there, you stick in the sterilizer, then you're carrying it down a hall to get to an operating room, completely open, open to anything that could possibly happen to it, all right? So you want to be using something that is a closed system, like the containers that you see on the bottom. It doesn't necessarily have to be those, but you need something that has a closed system to protect cell items when you're bringing it to the sterile field. When you're bringing it away from the sterile field, all instruments that were on the sterile field, whether used or not, are considered contaminated your entire back table. Okay, don't separate your instruments used, not used, to give the person in sterile processing um, a clue as to what you're using, what you didn't, so they know what to wash and what not to wash. I've seen that happen. Okay, these weren't used, you know, we're fine here. Oh, these were used, so we have to wash these separately or do something different. It mm, doesn't work that way. Everything on your table. If it goes on your back table, it gets washed clean, whether it went in the eye or not, okay? Containment of contaminated items should be achieved using some type of container that's been identified to prevent staff from coming into contact with it, okay? You need a closed system to be able to bring these dirty instruments out of the operating room. The container must be leak proof, puncture resistant, marked with a biohazard label, things like closed cart, bins with lids, and permeable bags, rigid sterilization container systems. The use of rigid containers, just to let you know, just make sure it's confirmed by the IFU that you're using it for dirty instruments as well, because some of them say that you shouldn't do that. But this can be something as simple as, as this, you guys. This is just a regular storage bin, but it's leak proof. It's puncture proof. There's a biohazard label on it. It's fine. You know, pretty inexpensive and easy. So you don't have to go out and buy anything too expensive. Just make sure you're you're following, you know, all of these rules. Just make sure that nothing can poke through it. And you have a biohazard label telling everybody what's in there. And my last piece of the day is education. So any personnel who perform sterilization activities really should have adequate training and have this skills verified, uh, competency verification. Unfortunately, this really isn't the type of field where you can see one, do one, teach one. You really have to know and understand sterilization to be able to perform sterilization, okay? Continuing education, review and update your knowledge. I mean, I think with gas sterilization, you have to get certified to be able to do it, and then it gets, it gets you get recertified over and over just to make sure that you remember, and that any, you know that you um, anything new and, and that may be coming along in gas sterilization. So you do this. You have to constantly be be checking and constantly be training and be educating yourself. Okay, in service training on new instruments, devices, equipments, and IFUs. All right, education. Um, at the end, I was going to discuss with you how you get a hold of me. I can tell you now that if you have any questions on how what's out there, how to learn on education, right? I'm gonna show you how to, how to contact me. Please, please feel free to reach out to me. I love to network, I love to share information, and we're all in this together. So if you're looking for ways to, to, to learn and educate, please let me help you. And that is the end, you guys. Can you give us a definition of decontamination? Basically, decontamination is what you're doing to wash and decontaminate these instruments and prepare them for sterilization. This is what you're doing to prepare your instruments to go into the sterilizer, okay? It can be manual cleaning. It can be using a sonic machine. Either way, decontamination is the first step in sterile processing. This is what you're doing to prepare your instruments for the sterilization process. You want low foaming because you don't want, that, that foaming, that detergent, that soap, there's so much of it. And you, it's gonna be harder to rinse off, basically. You wanna make sure you rinse, 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 rinse. You want something that's low foaming, okay? Sterile water combined with alcohol. Be, be careful with that alcohol, okay? The question is, what is your opinion on washing in or flushing instruments with sterile water combined with alcohol? I would be very careful with that alcohol. Don't forget, everyone, if you're, what you're doing now with these instruments is 
you're gonna get clean, washed, sterilized, and then used on another patient. So if you're using alcohol and that alcohol is not rinsed out correctly, if you're even if it's mixed with the sterile water, if you're not rinsing and rinsing and rinsing well enough, you're, you you have the chance of this alcohol getting put into the intraocular tissue of another patient. So sterile water with air. Okay, you always want to follow it up with air. What kind of lubricant that could be used for moistening the instruments? We've never used it. Um, there's all different types of lubricants. There's so many of them out there. I really can't say a specific one or whether one is uh, better than the other. Um, but lubricants are yeah, mostly used just to provide your hinges to be able to open up easily. I'm, I'm sure many of you, myself as well, have given an instrument to a surgeon and it doesn't open or you know the scissors aren't opening and closing very well. That's what your lubricants are for. I can't really recommend a, a one that's better than another. Um, but again, like I said, please feel free to reach out and I'm sure I can help you find one. Can we use rusted instruments after proper sterilization? Not, you know, not really, because what happens with rusted instruments, what happens with that rust? It can come off. All right, even after proper sterilization, you're, what, you're sterilizing over rust. Okay, you, and that rust, those particles can come off. So if you're noticing rust on your instruments, you need to take that out of circulation and you need to get that rust off before you can use it on a patient. Can you use some light on um, erosion? I'm not sure the question, um, if you're getting instruments that are possibly causing Erosion, um, it could be from rust. You want to be checking your detergent. You want to be checking your water, your water quality as well. Okay, do a study. Take a look and see what you have um, for water quality, what you have um, for your detergent, pH balance as well. So that's typically what causes erosion. Mass cataract surgery. So opinion about sterilizing and decontaminating for mass cataract surgery it shouldn't change. Whether you're doing 30, 50, 20 or 10 cases in a day, it doesn't change, okay? Your process is the same. You have to take the time to clean properly, sterilize properly, store to and from the sterile field, everything's the same. So whether you're doing cataract surgery in mass quantities or whether you're doing 10 cases, you're not gonna go any faster, you're not gonna take any shortcuts, okay? You're gonna do everything still the same, so it shouldn't matter. Decontamination and sterilization. So decontamination is the process of preparing your instruments for sterilization. You're decontaminating them, you're washing them, you're cleaning them, you're using detergent, you're scrubbing them, um, you're getting that bio burden off and preparing them for sterilization. Sterilization is um, ridding your instruments of any kind of materials that can that are infectious. Decontamination doesn't do that. Okay, you're sterilizing your your you're killing microorganisms. Decontamination is that you're preparing these instruments by ridding it of bio burden to prepare it for sterilization. What is the most essential standard procedures of maintaining the autoclave? Um, the use of a steam autoclave. Really, that's gonna be, maintaining it is gonna be according to the manufacturer's instructions for use. Okay, you shouldn't be taking these things apart and, and putting them back together again and maintaining them. You want to check and make sure that they're being maintained properly by doing your blood tests, by doing your blood dick tests. Okay, that's how you're checking and making sure that they're being maintained. But as far as maintaining them and having them looked at, that's that's manufacturer's instructions. Somebody should be coming and doing that that knows and understands these sterilizers very well and knows how to take them apart and knows how to make sure that they're they're going to be running properly. Which is uh, excuse me, which is the best and worst sterilization process keeping in view? of all aspects. So like I was saying, there really isn't a best and worst of sterilization process. Okay, it's just a matter of what's most appropriate for what you're doing, okay? In view of all aspects, I'm not quite sure of that question, but if you're looking at what is the best and worst sterilization process, there really isn't one. Um, it just depends on what type of instrument that you're using, all right, and what you're doing um, as far as, you know, you're in clinic and you're using, um, you know, lenses, you may not have a big sterilizer in clinic, and you're in the operating room, and you're, you're doing retina, retina instruments, many of them do require another type of sterilization besides um, steam, because you may be using lens instruments and things like that, so you may have to use gas or another type, you know, some type of chemical rather than um, steam, but either way, it's about what's more appropriate, not so much what's um, good or bad. So.
can we use expired IOLs? Oh, and then I'm not sure if this means that you should be sterilizing expired IOLs. I would say no, definitely. There's a reason. I know that typically it's expired because it's, you know, that manufacturer is saying that after a certain amount of time, um, you know, what's in there is not probably sterile anymore and that they've expired. But these are implants and implants is a whole other ball game, you guys. This is, you know, a whole different animal. All right, I would not recommend sterilizing IOLs in any form. All right, let it come from the manufacturer. Um, are there N95 or any masks that can be sterilized? I don't know. I don't use N95 masks, so I'm afraid I can't answer that question. That's going to come from the manufacturer. All right, whether or not an N95 mask can be sterilized, you'd have to check and look at the instructions for that. Um, sterile items should keep, may I know all the sterile items should keep in container. I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure I understand that question, but you do want to keep your sterile items in a closed and covered container to try to keep away from it being, the, being contaminated during the uh, return to the sterile field. Can you use ineffective and non-ineffective cases separately? Universal precautions, you guys. Whether uh, whether it's infective, you have to pretend that everybody's infected. You have to think everyone's infected. You should not be sterilizing instruments any differently for someone that's um, you know could possibly be infected or someone who's not. It, it you don't know for sure who's coming into your operating room and who's infected and who's not. Okay, this isn't something that you may not you may know all the time. So you have to use universal precautions, no matter what. Um, you have to use the same process for every single patient as if every person is infected, you're not gonna do anything different, okay? Um, autoclaves, again, you can reach out to me. I'm happy to talk more about different autoclaves and different processes. Um, and again, same thing with the frosted glass slide test. I don't use it, I've never used it, um, but I can certainly try to help you find the information on that. Um, suggest a good book for sterilization. So again, this is why I, uh, I sent out my um, conflict of interest. I, I do sit on the board for, ASOM, Society of Ophthalmic Registered Nurses. I don't get paid for that. I get no compensation. It's all volunteer. But I did edit a book many years ago on sterilization of instruments through ASON. It, it is a good book. It will give you a great overview of sterilization um, for your instruments. I can certainly help you find that. Um, in the United States, we use our processes for sterilization typically have to follow what's called CAMI. And that's the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. All right, AMI is what we have to follow. So when a, a surveyor or a state inspector comes in to watch our processes, they're going to ask us, well, you know, where do you, who do you go to for your regulations and making your possible procedures? We have to follow AMI. So it's A-A-M-I, and typically they're the ones who set the rules for sterilization. So they're a great resource as well. Um, high volume campaigns instruments that dip in alcohol between uses. Any comment, any thoughts on whether dipping in data then? I don't. I don't have any thought on that. Um, I've never done that myself. And again, it's going to be the you know, manufacturer's recommendations of how you should be cleaning them. So when you get those instruments, when those instruments come in, there's always that little tiny package wrapper in there. But that wrapper is what's going to tell you how to clean these instruments. So if it tells you you should be dipping them in alcohol, you should be dipping them in alcohol. Datadyne, I've never seen that, um, but you want to go by the manufacturer's instructions for use. You don't want to make up your own um, procedures, you guys. This is where you could run into a problem. So the manufacturers are telling you how to clean those instruments, what you need to do to clean them um, best, so you want to follow their rules. Should we put protectors on instruments during sterilization? Yes, you can, as long as it's validated for that. So you can put tip protectors on them as long as the protectors and the IFU says that it can withstand steam sterilization. Absolutely, you want to put protectors on them. You don't want your capsular rexus forceps um, to be inside a set with all the other instruments that can possibly you know, get, um, get crushed. So you, you do want to use tip protectors. Just make sure those tip protectors are validated to be able to use the sterilizer that you're using and that they have holes or some type of means for the steam or whatever you're using, gas steam, to be able to penetrate through. Okay, but definitely, you can certainly use tip protectors. Decontamination solutions with the appropriate concentration. There's so many out there. Um, I couldn't really recommend one or the other to you. Um, there are so, so many out there. So you just want to, you want to look for one that has a neutral pH and all those characteristics I talked about. Um, one of the things with tasks that you want to be careful for and look out for is when you're trying new things over and over again. Okay, we've also found that um, when it comes to tasks, it's very difficult to narrow down what caused it when you're using different means 
for detergents. So if you're using a different detergent every week, that's not good for being able to track something like TAS. Um, if you find something that's working and working well, stick with it. If you do want to change something, that's okay, but document it. Right? Document that on this date, we changed to this one. You know, we think this one's less expensive and still going to give us good quality, still giving us everything that we need. So you can track it and you can go back. Because when you change things over and over again, that's when you have a hard time tracking. Oh, I have a little bit of time to answer some more. Um, can we use formalin in gas? It, I'm not sure if that means can you put a formalin inside of like a gas can, gas um, sterilizer, but I would check with the manufacturer's instructions. Maybe not. Um, I'm not sure if you can gas formalin. I don't know. Um, you want to you want to check with the manufacturer's instructions on that. All right. I, I would hate to tell you that you know certain things you can put in there and, and be wrong. All right. I don't want to give you the wrong information. I really don't know that. Um, how do you remove the lubricants? Um, it's going to depend on the instructions. Typically, the lubricants, they get dipped, and they get set aside, um, and they dry on there, all right? So typically, sometimes lubricants just stay on there, and it, it'll, it'll dissipate on the instrument, so to speak. Um, many of these don't get washed off, because you can wash them off, you sort of tend to um, you know, defeat the purpose. So just look at the instructions, but typically you dip them and sit them there to dry. Hospitalization operating room should be, does the centralized HEPA system still suitable in the COVID-19 pandemic era? So far from what I can see, yes. So I have looked at the AMI recommendations before I did the slide. I reached out to a friend of mine that actually works with AMI to see if anything has changed. And nothing has changed so far as far as that's concerned. All right, your HEPA, your, um, your HEPA systems um, all stayed the same. So right now, all I can tell you is nothing's changed with COVID. I don't know if that will change in the future. Um, but during these pandemic times, from what I can see, everything so far has stayed the same. I, I'm not sure if we use the lubricant or if there's a follow from us as company sterilizing our instruments. So you're using an outside vendor. Check with them. All right, check with them. There's nothing wrong with if you're using an outside vendor to sterilize your instruments and then it comes back to your facility. You want to you want to check with them and see what they're doing. Well, first of all, if they're if they're sterilizing your instruments, you, you need to be checking on their processes. If you're using instruments that someone else sterilized. You want to be checking on their processes, that they're using all the correct um, processes in place to assure that those instruments are sterilized and they're, in, and they're also being taken care of. Okay, so check and make sure they're getting lubricated. Check and make sure they're doing their blood tests and all of their testing. Okay. Which temperature we can put phacal hand pieces in free vac? That is going to be the, the sterilizer and the phacal machine's um, instructions for use. They must be compatible with each other. Okay. I can't tell you the correct um, process, but the little insert on that fake hand piece, and that when that came in from the manufacturer, that's what's going to tell you. And then you have to make sure that that's compatible with the sterilizer. Okay? Many sterilizers work at 270 degrees Fahrenheit for four minutes sterilization and then a dry time. That seems to be an, uh, an average one, but then that, that may not be the best for your fake hand piece. If that manufacturer is going to tell you on that little piece of paper, if you don't have that, um, look it up. Call your manufacturer. Look online and see what they're saying. You have to sterilize this at this temp for this amount of time at this pressure, and make sure your sterilizer does that. And make sure you, they're all validated now for the same. Can tap water be used? So the manufacturer will typically tell you whether tap water can be used. I would say no, only because tap water can have so many impurities. Um, but it depends on what you're using tap water for. So a lot of people do use tap water in their sauna machines, but they're rinsing. And rinsing and rinsing this distilled treated water. Okay, so yes, some many places use tap water in their sinks to clean instruments with, but they're not rinsing with the tap water. Your last rinse to rinse everything out really should be treated you know, sterile distilled water. So you can use tap water. Um, I would check with the manufacturer and see because all those impurities with tap water, when you overuse with tap water, that's when you're going to start getting um, some of those those stains and those spots on your instruments. Okay, unless you have a really good filter system in your facility. Some people do put a water filter system in just for their decon room. Um, but if not, and you're just using tap water, just make sure that the manufacturer says it's okay. Typically, yes, typically you can use tap water. Just make sure you're rinsing, rinsing, rinsing your last step with was distilled water or treated water. Um, which type of autoclave is best? I can't say, like I said, it just depends. It's not really what's best, it's really what's more appropriate. 
also generally used for rinsing. So check the manufacturer's instructions. It's really going to be, I, I don't know like a pH for, for rinsing. I'm not 100% sure. I just know the pH for detergent should be between six to eight. Otherwise, as far as, um, you know, water generally used for rinsing, I, I'm not 100% sure. You really want to check and see if um, what you're rinsing and what those instruments, if it has any recommendation of what you should be rinsing with. How do you make sterilization your face mask easily? Very fine. Thank you. <laughs> um, how do you make so your face mask that you're using in the decon room can be, you know, um, it needs to be visit, um, fluid resistant. Okay, um, something with either your goggles and a fluid resistant mask. You can have your mask with the shield on top. Either way, it needs to be it needs to be fluid resistant. It needs to be have adequate for your eyes, and that's not just regular glasses that you can wear. If you wear glasses, you have to wear goggles or something over them. Okay. Um, steam sterilization sets come out wet, depending on the type of water plate. Yes, they can, especially those tabletops. So if they're coming out wet, typically you really need to be going through the drying process. You want to A, check and make sure that the sterilizers are, are running properly. But sometimes they do come out, they shouldn't come out soaked. They should not come out dripping. But sometimes they do come out a little bit wet. Um, when, if they do, you need to take those, those, those instruments in its rack and you sit them down and you let it dry. You do not want to be handling wet packages, okay, because that's when it's going to just strike right through your instruments and go through them. Right? And you may not even know it right, and get contaminated. So if your instruments are coming out wet, it depends on how wet, all right, you don't want them to be soaked, but some of those tabletops can come out a little bit wet, so you want to make sure they dry, 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 dry. All right, guys, I think I only have one or two minutes left. Okay. Can you sterilize expired or unused? No, I would not. Nope. Anything unused, I would not sterilize them. Okay. Um, you really have to just only sterilize things that are delegated to sterilization. You don't want to be sterilizing things that's going to go into ocular that were expired and you're re sterilizing them. Okay. So I wouldn't do that. Can you soak cannulated instruments? I wouldn't soak them in detergent, I wouldn't soak them in lubricant. Okay. You risk the possibility of it getting left inside of there. All right, even though you're rinsing, 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 um, I would not soak them in detergent or anything that can cause cast. Okay, um, some facilities do put them in their detergent, and that's okay. It's just make sure that you're rinsing, 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 rinsing. Um, but it is a accepted practice, from what I can see from many centers, that they're rinsing it or they're putting it. Um, in solution, like just distilled water followed by air, they're not using detergent. Um, but if you are using detergent, that's okay. Just make sure you're rinsing, 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 okay, and followed by air. Okay, and I think you guys, I apologize, I think that's probably where our time is up. Um, again, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope this was helpful. CyberSite, if you'd like to reach out to me, please feel free to reach out to me either um, you can reach out to me through CyberSite, sign up for CyberSite, send me your questions, send me any cases that you have in mind. I love to talk eyes, I love to network, and I'd love to get to know you better. So please feel free to reach out to me with any more questions. Um, I hope that you stay well and be safe, and uh, thank you again for joining us.